Hi, today we're starting Unit 3, which takes us to the nervous system. The nervous system coordinates and controls the body. It's, I don't want to say it's the most important system, but it does control all the rest of your systems. So it has a big role in maintaining homeostasis and making sure that everything is running as it should be. It's going to sense what's going on around you and inside you, and it's going to process that information and send out signals to tell the rest of your body parts what to do and how to act. So that is the main function of the nervous system. Obviously it's going to include the brain, but the spinal cord, nerves, and sense organs throughout the body are also going to play a vital part of this system. So let's take a look at some of the basics. So the nervous system, like I just said, if you look at the picture, it's going to sense information and then your brain and spinal cord are going to process this information kind of as a control center and then parts of the brain that are responsible for different things will make a decision and send out that information which is called motor output to the different areas of your body so in this case you see something that means your senses are detecting something your brain processes it very quickly and then sends out a message in this case to your muscles saying to do this thing. Sometimes we call this the sensing, we call it the afferent pathway, and then we call the motor output or the thing that they're doing or the effect the effector. So we have the afferent and the efferent pathways, which are terms I'm not going to use in this course. So if this looks familiar, it should be because we covered it in unit one and with homeostasis you have the sensor, the control center, and the effector. So the receptor, this is the senses, sensing information around you or inside you. Your control center, which is mainly your nervous system or your brain, deciding what should be done about this information. And then your brain or control center sending out the information to the effector, which are things like your muscles and your glands, to make sure that everything is at its set point and homeostasis is being maintained. The nervous system is broken up into several divisions. The two main divisions are the central and the peripheral nervous systems, but then the peripheral is actually broken up into a few more divisions. There's a flow chart on your notes, and I'm going to get to that slide in just a minute. But first, let's talk about the two big main divisions, the central nervous system and the peripheral. These work hand in hand, and they communicate on a daily basis back and forth between each other. So the central nervous system is mainly your brain and your spinal cord, and that's because it's down the central axis of your body. Your central nervous system is going to process any information that it gets from your peripheral nervous system, and then it's going to integrate it, create a response, and send it back out to the peripheral nervous system. There's always, you could see that picture, input and output between the two systems. The peripheral nervous system is really all the rest of the nerves that are not part of the spine, spinal cord, or the brain. And we're going to talk about some different categories of nerves in a little bit. But the main thing here is that your peripheral nervous system is collecting information or sensing it, and then it's also carrying it back out. So that's the motor output. As I mentioned, the peripheral nervous system is broken up into even more divisions. And those divisions are listed here. So we're going to talk about the sensory and the motor, which are the first two divisions of the peripheral. But then the motor is broken up into the somatic and autonomic. And then the autonomic is broken up into the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. I know that's a lot. So that's why I made the flowchart to help us understand it a little bit better. So here's a flow chart that's on your notes, and you could fill in the missing information as I go. The nervous system is broken into the central and the peripheral nervous systems. And the central nervous system is mainly the brain and spinal cord. And as I mentioned, this is the processing center, that they get all the information from the peripheral nervous system, and then they're going to send out the response. We are going to focus mainly on the brain of the central nervous system in the next video. The peripheral nervous system is only going to be focused on right here. I'm not going to go into any more detail than what you see in front of you, just because of the nature of this class. So the peripheral nervous system is anything that's not in the central nervous system. And as I mentioned, it's broken up into many different divisions. These are going to either be sensing or carrying information out to the different parts of your body. So I tried to color coordinate it so it made more sense. The first two main divisions are the motor and the sensory. 
for the peripheral. The sensory is exactly what it sounds like. It senses stuff around you and inside of you. They're your sense organs. Think of the nerves that help you smell, help you taste, help you touch, help you see, etc. These are your senses. We're going to talk about the senses after we introduce the nervous system. And they're going to send the information, if you follow the blue line, to your central nervous system. But then your central nervous system is going to process it, and if, if you follow the red arrows, it's going to send it back to the peripheral nervous system, but through the motor. And so these are the actions, these are the effects that that information is going to have. So these are going from the central nervous system to the muscles and glands of your body to tell them how to respond or what to do or to become more active or less, less active or for your muscles to contract or relax, etc. Now there's two types of motor responses. There's somatic and autonomic. So you have your somatic nervous system and your autonomic nervous system. Your somatic nervous system, these are you're going to be your, your anything that you can voluntarily control, which are your skeletal muscles. We just finished the muscular system in unit two, and we talked about how skeletal muscles contract. And so this, these are the voluntary things. For example, if somebody pushes you, you're gonna to respond to that because you have muscles and ways that you can voluntarily control. If you wanna have, if you have an itch on your nose, I could come and scratch it voluntarily because of the somatic nervous system. But there are things that happen automatically that you can't have control over. These are involuntary responses. So think of them as automatic, which is a good name because they're called autonomic, but I think of automatic. So they're involuntary things that you can't control. So think about your heart and your cardiac muscle. That just beats no matter what. And smooth muscles, like of your digestive system, processing food and moving it through, you can't control that. It just happens. They're automatic. So this is the autonomic nervous system. Now, the autonomic nervous system also has two of its own divisions, which are called the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. Now, most of you have heard of the fight or flight response. So I'll start here. This is called your sympathetic nervous system. So these are things that when you're in very stressful situations, these are the responses that your body has. So let's say that something scares you. Your heart rate increases, your blood pressure increases, you start to sweat, you, you, know, you may get goosebumps. Like these are, the, this is sympathetic fight or flight response. Typically you respond in this way when something is very threatening and maybe potentially life-threatening. That's sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight. The parasympathetic nervous system is the one that we're probably mostly in all the time. This is where we're resting and digesting. Our digestive system is processing everything. We're at a resting heart rate. We're at a resting blood pressure. It's just normal day activities. Nothing too strenuous, nothing too stressful. And so these are all automatically controlled by your autonomic nervous system, which is your motor nervous system, which is part of your peripheral nervous system. So I know that there's a lot here, but those that's pretty much the peripheral nervous system and what I want you to know with its divisions. To get even a little bit more in detail with the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems, these I thought were some good examples of the differences between the two. So you have your sympathetic, your fight or flight on the right, and you have your parasympathetic, which is rest and digest on the left. And you could see the differences in different body parts when they're in a very stressful, life-threatening, vital scenario versus a not so vital, normal, restful, not stressful scenario. I don't know if that makes sense. And so your, whether your eyes are dilated or constricted, uh, whether your blood pressure is high or low, your heart rate is fast or slow, you could kind of compare what's going on with some of your major organs by looking at these pictures. So moving on to nervous tissue. Nervous tissue is really what your nervous system is all about. It's the main type of tissue that makes up the nervous system, obviously. And nervous tissue is actually quite complex, but one simple thing about it is that there's two types. And after you get through that, it gets a lot more complex. So we're gonna keep it simple here and just talk about the basics. The two types are neuroglia. 
Sometimes these are called glial cells or glia or supporting cells. These are the ones that people usually don't think of a lot when they think of the nervous system. These are the nourishing and supporting neurons. They actually help your neurons, which is a second type. These are the more numerous types of cells. They outnumber neurons nine to one, which is a lot. And one other thing is that these type of cells, your neuroglia, never lose their ability to divide. So these could actually continuously divide. And a lot of people think, and I even told you a few years ago when I had you in class, that nerve cells don't divide. And, well, neurons don't, nerve cells don't. But there are types of nervous tissue cells that do. And so if you've ever heard of somebody getting like a brain tumor, maybe it's a glioma because it's a ter certain type of neuroglial cell that's dividing rapidly causing a tumor in their brain. So some nerve cells can divide and some cannot, and the ones that cannot are your neurons or your typical nerve cells. These are the ones that are going to generate impulses. And an impulse is really the firing of nervous tissue that happens within milliseconds. And we're gonna talk about how that happens in a different video. So those are the two major types, and they have different structures and there's different types of each one of them, that, but we're just gonna go over the general structure. There are different types of neuroglial cells. And I mentioned at the top, you don't, you're not responsible for knowing these for this class, but I want you to know that they exist. So I did not leave a spot in your notes to write these down on purpose, but I want you to pay attention. So neuroglia, there's different types of neuroglia. There are six major different types of cells, and some are only found in the central nervous system, and a couple other types are only found in the peripheral. And again, these are your supporting cells. They support the nerve cells and the neurons. <clears throat> so there's astrocytes. These are going to provide nutrients and produce hormones. You have microglia. These are phagocytic, which means that they could eat stuff like bacteria and other cell debris. There's ependymal cells that line different cavities in the brain. We'll mention the ventricles when we get to the brain. There's oligodendrocytes, and these are going to form a substance called myelin that we're going to get to. Also, it's a fatty substance that wraps around special nerve cells. And then in the peripheral nervous system, we have two types of neuroglia called Schwann cells that we'll also mention a little bit later that form myelin in the peripheral ner nervous system. And then we have satellite cells that tend to be protective of the neurons and they help cushion them and kind of hold everything together. And if you look at the picture at the bottom, you could see that they all have sort of different shapes and that's because they all have sort of different jobs. But the one that we're going to focus on that I do want you to know and that you need to write down are the types of neurons. So neurons are classified as either sensory neurons, interneurons, or motor neurons. Sensory neurons simply carry impulses from your sense organs like, you know, your sense of touch, your sense of taste, etc., your sensory neurons to your central nervous system. And then your inner neurons are mainly the neurons that are found in your brain and spinal cord, your central nervous system. And they're going to process and relay this information back out to the motor neurons. And this is the most common type of neuron that there is. It is estimated that 99% of all neurons are interneurons in your brain and spinal cord. And then we have motor neurons. Motor neurons are going to be the ones that get the information from the central nervous system and send it to your glands and your muscles and body parts to tell them how to respond or how to act. And neurons come in different sort of sizes and shapes and length. We're just gonna go over the general structure of a general neuron, but not all of them typically look like this. But before we do that, I just wanted to show you this picture. This is just showing the difference between these neurons. And so this picture on the left shows sensor receptors from your toe stepping on a tack, and this very long neuron that goes up to your spinal cord. And you can see the red changes to green. The green would be an inner neuron that processes. And then it goes back out to this blue neuron, which is your motor neuron that tells your muscles to contract and lift your foot off the tack. So sensing, processing, and responding sensory, inter, and motor neurons. This shows pretty much the same thing. A sensory neuron in the blue, we have the green inner neurons that process in the brain and spinal cord, and then we have motor neurons that go out to your glands and muscles to elicit a response or an effect. So let's take a look at the general anatomy of a neuron. In other words, 
what a neuron looks like and what parts make it up. All neurons have three major parts, the cell body, dendrites, and the axon. So the cell body simply is the larger area, as you can see in this very simplistic picture. The general area is the cell body, contains the different organelles such as a nucleus, um, mitochondria, Golgi, etc. It's also called the soma, which means body in Latin. Then we have dendrites. Dendrites protrude or stick off the cell body, and their job is to sense any information coming in, and then also to transmit it down the rest of the nerve cell through an axon, which is this long tail-like thing. So we have the cell body, which has a bunch of dendrites. By the way, dendra in Latin means tree or branching, so that's why it looks like a little tree. And then the axon is this long part, and that long axon carries the information towards the end of the neuron to where it can go to the next neuron and the message can continue. And one other thing is the axon, sometimes they're alone, but sometimes they're found in bundles. And so if you have a bunch of axons together in a bundle, that's where the word nerve actually comes from. So a neuron is one cell, but a bundle of them is a nerve. Let's go on to the other couple parts of a general neuron. We have the axon terminals. So the axon runs down and then we have like the end of the neuron. Those are the axon terminals. They kind of branch out over here. These are the parts that are gonna meet up with other neurons or other cells, like maybe a muscle cell to let it know that it needs to contract. Not all, but many axons are wrapped in a fat called myelin or the myelin sheath and this fatty insulation is made by a type of cell that we mentioned earlier it's a glial cell if they're in the peripheral nervous system they're made by schwann cells but if they're in the central nervous system they're made by oligodendrocytes so this fat is made to wrap around it think of an electrical cord with a plastic wrapping around it it'd be the same thing here but there are little gaps in it, so it's not continuous. And these little gaps that are found in between the myelin are called nodes of Ranvier, and named after the guy who figured it out. And the purpose of these little gaps in the myelin is to actually make the impulse travel a lot faster. And so it takes less time for the information to get from one end to the other as it jumps down there. That's something called saltatory conduction that we're obviously not gonna to get to in this class. And this is just another picture showing a more detailed version of the cell body, the dendrites, the long axon with the myelin wrapped around it, and the axon terminals, sometimes called synaptic ter terminals instead. But one last thing I want to mention is that this shows a good job of this information only going in one direction. So it enters through the dendrites and it leaves out the axon terminals. So when the neuron fires, that's the direction that it always goes. It's kind of a one lane road. And that's it for the general introduction of the nervous system, its divisions, and the different cells that make it up. So I hope that was helpful and I hope that you learned something. See you in the next video. Bye.